Hi there. Welcome everybody. We're sitting in the back of Tim J. Leary Studios in the studio part of the studio. Um, I'm very excited tonight. Um, my dear friend Dawn Marie Forsyth is going to be with us tonight talking about her artwork. Some of it is behind me and uh, we'll get on to, to that um, in a little while and the gallery is filled with her beautiful work. Um, Dawn Marie and I for years uh, taught together at the Fashion Institute of Design and Merchandising in San Francisco and uh, we used to collaborate on uh, workshops on creativity and the like. Um, Dawn would come to my classes and get students all enthused about their uh, fashion design careers. So Dawn is a fashion designer and a visual artist and lives in LA and uh, showed up yesterday with a truckload of wonderful art. So, um, so tonight's topic is going to be about creativity and about um, the ideas behind Dawn's work, which have to do with um, body image and such. So um, I don't want to pin things down too much. So as usual, I'll start with my libation. <laughs> it is five o'clock after all. This is uh, Jameson Black Barrel. Someone gifted me with this wonderful uh, peaty whiskey. It's really good. Um, I like it a lot. So, um, cheers, everyone. So, Dawn, do you want to um, say anything about where you started? Yeah, you can. We'll have to be casual. You want to move or sit in the chair? Yeah. Um, about where you started with these images Hi, that are behind me. Um, what, was, what was your first thought process? I know that I remember when you started this uh, series. Right. And so. My first thought process was about how clothing creates, creates identity and how our image can be perceived in various ways depending on what we wear. And so I was curious about if we took the body out of the garment, if that image or the identity shifted at all, or is all the identity in the, in the person or is it in the garment or do you need both to be able to communicate okay. your ideas I mean you know so it was just a process of self-discovery and being a fashion designer and working in the design world and as an educator really kind of going like why is it so many people are so obsessed with how they look how they dress and kind of trying to dissect that. Cool, and so I'm presuming it's still an open question and we are yes. still looking at it and so. thinking about it. Um, I went to my uh, limited uh, uh, art book shelves to pull out some things about two of this. One of the things that we have always talked about is creative process. We were even talking about this uh, pen that I have that says from Ai Weiwei, creativity is a part of human nature. It can only be untaught. So um, yes. So let me touch on that for a second. Um, I pulled out this book, Frida Kahlo, um, a popular artist uh, from Mexico, uh, married to uh, Diego Rivera. Um, her, um, somebody's hammering on the wall on the other side. Um, her diary was print, copied and printed, and uh, there is some text in here, but for the most part, her diary is a combination of images and words. So the thing that strikes me about this, from my experience, is that, um, and we were talking about this at the museum the other day in light of a new exhibit that's there, when I do artwork, um, it's nonverbal. So, of course, a diary 
of mine would be a combination of images and words, right? Because I'm verbal, um, obviously, as I'm talking now, and I talk a lot. Um, but I, um, uh, I'm nonverbal first, um, which was a, um, the subject of a faculty in service once. I think you may have moved on to LA at the time. Um, the English majors were certain that words came first, and the artists were certain that images came first. And so I think that everybody was right because they were talking about themselves. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I thought. Her images are very interesting because she, um, in a lot of ways, had a very unhappy life. She had a great deal of illness. She had a husband who um, was a womanizer and was not very good to her. Um, and they were both really successful and really fabulous artists. So I find this book, even though I haven't read all of the text that other people wrote in it, um, I feel is kind of a treasure to, to look at. Do you keep a journal? Look, yeah, they must be hanging new work next door. Yeah. So come on down and see some sure, new the work. Cover, the cover. <laughs> um, yes, I have. Um, I probably have 24 journals at least over the years. I have a flat file in my studio, and one of the flat, well, actually, two of the flat files are full of journals that I've written in. I do a lot of writing. I am very much word oriented and I'm very verbal in my processing. If I get an idea, I have to talk about it um, more than I have to draw about it. Right? I have to talk about it and write about it more than I have to draw about it. But I do do collage work, drawing work um, to get myself stimulated. I also am very inspired by things I read. Like if I find myself in a creative slump, it's very I have a, a, it's very easy for me to get out of my creative slump. I finally somewhere a long time ago discovered that if I just um, open a book that is maybe one of my favorite books or one of my favorite authors or one of my favorite artists and I start to read within one paragraph, I've got an idea and I have moved on to something else. I'm up and I'm working in the studio. So words are really important to me, yeah. Even though I consider myself a visual person. I have a different take on when I get into a creative slump. Um, for me, my technique is to start working. Um, I base this on a story I read about Juan Miro, who is one of my favorite artists. Um, and he, um, he suffered depression when he was young like when he was 19, he suffered very serious depression. And so his um, solution to that was to work 40 hours a week. So he worked from nine to five, like Monday to Friday, keeping a strict schedule so that he was always busy and always doing something to avoid dipping into the depression. And so based on that idea, and when I went to Ireland to do the residency, I, if I'm really stuck, I pull out a sketch pad and I doodle until something starts to take. Yeah. So I do it by doing the work. That's my, my technique of uh, getting out of the slump. And I find, as I always have in my visual career, that um, I had more ideas when I was doing more projects. If I was only right. doing one project, yes. I don't have any ideas. But yeah. if I'm doing six projects, I've got 40 ideas. Yes, so I, I like to have three or four paintings or drawings in process because I find I have a tendency to, my, my process is long because I love process. <laughs> and so once I get started, I don't want to stop. And you can, I feel like I can, oh, I have a tendency to overwork my pieces. Um, so, what I've done over the years is learned a technique to have at least three works going at the same time. So that when I start to feel that I just want to keep painting, I can stop on that one and move to the other one and paint there because I have the energy and I have the idea and I have the desire, right? So that I can take some breathing space between the task or the 
the love and the passion of painting and the result that I'm trying to pursue. So I don't, so I find those two meeting rather than becoming further and further apart from each other, if that makes any sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, so let's move on to bodies a little bit if we can, because I have these three things that I think ah, yes. can prompt some thoughts. So I'm going to start with the Stanley Roman, uh, Roseman and the dance. So Stanley Roseman is a European artist. Um, I'm fortunate enough to have some cousins in Geneva and um, at uh, Uncle Norman's house I was introduced to this artist and he was uh, able to do gesture drawings which if anybody uh, has ever taken a, a, a drawing class or a figure drawing class gesture drawing is a good place to start because it's very simple so he did it says drawings from the Paris Opera so that's the truth he was able to go backstage and do quick sketches of the dancers while they were dancing and so um, I'm going to just randomly flip here and see if I can find some really wonderful this gorgeous gesture you can see her skirt and her shape and also by those simple lines we know it's a shape more simple lines and it looks like a he but very simple and very fast Drawings like this take 30 to 60 seconds yes. to do. So the gesture drawing of being able to get down the expression of the movement right. in a quick, simple... Right, not looking at the body details. Right. I'm sure when you've taught uh, fashion sketching... Or draping. Or draping, this is the that sort is of thing you would focus on. I love right? the word gesture, right? The, the, the word... The, the idea of a nuanced gesture that can change the meaning or the expression of the drawing in this case. Right, right. Like in this one, there's a few facial details there, which I would imagine were added later um, to these very elegant gestures. Some of them look a little more scribbly, but they're still gorgeous. I'm gonna flip quick. I like this one, two dancers. You have to study it for a minute to see there's two heads, there are four arms, mm. a couple of legs on the bottom doing a dance. So it's more about what it feels like. What right. the dance feels like and right. and where those, almost where those energy expressions are coming from in the form of the movement, right? So right. the looking at the movement and watching it, you're trying to capture that expression of the movement with these kind of really quick reference points. It's beautiful. Yeah, I love this book. I saw the book first at, in uh, Uncle Norman's apartment. These are gorgeous, I think. He says who the dancers are, correct? So, um, so from that idea of draping and because draping flow, can be like that too, yeah. Yeah, um, and this so this could lead as a, a beginning. Whenever I taught any of these drawing classes, I always like to use gesture drawing because it's it's a little confounding when you start it and it helps you, it frees you because you have to do it so fast, um, you can't obsess over it and you have to be free. If you're gonna do a drawing in 60 seconds, you can't think about it, you just have to do it. And that's why it, it was always uh, good and fun to do with students. <laughs> but as a teacher, I didn't have to do them. <laughs> I did them anyway. So, all right, oh, this is gorgeous. So, but another way of uh, looking at the idea of fashion sketching is Erte, who uh, was very popular around the Palm Springs area. I think he was very popular with the older gay community, the gen generation um, prior to us and, uh, and some of us, but um, uh, 
because, because we're dying off. For lo he's losing popularity. He was the fashion designer or the costume designer for the Follies Berger, I believe in the late 1800s, and then uh, went on to art making where he did uh, gouache drawings, fashion sketches for Harper's Bazaar magazine every month for uh, 15 years. And those gouaches are still around. Um, but he did really elaborate, really elegant, uh, now if I can find one, right? Well, like this one here is elaborate, costumey, um, but really fun. Can you see it, Dawn? Mm, yeah. Are you seeing this one? So, um, bronzes, he made bronzes and he made uh, paintings and prints. And those are my favorites of prints. And it's interesting up against the um, dance um, gesture drawings by um, the Air, first. Oh, by Stanley Roseman. Yeah, by Stanley Roseman. There, if you were to dissect the color blocking that Erte does with the parts of the body, they're kind of that gesture. Right? Each mm -hmm. one is a part of a gesture drawing. This one is a silhouette here. I love this one. Um, two faces in silhouette. Um, there's also... Um, I don't want to go too fast, but I don't remember exactly what's in here. I didn't pick anything out to show. Um, that's a bronze, of course. Nobody drew like Erte at the time. You know, it's yeah. very much a signature, mm -hmm. his illustration style. He died in... I think in the late 80s or early 90s. So he had a good long life. There's And there's this exactness, like a lot of his uh, paintings that we're looking at, these illustrations we're looking at are two and three colors. Right, and not a lot of colors. Yeah, I mean, some of them have more, but I mean, two or three colors and it's like this part of the drawing or this part of the painting is this color, this part's this. And it's very precise, um, as complicated as they can appear. In a lot of ways, they're very simple. Would you say that that's uh, perhaps a design orientation? Maybe, yeah. As a designer, he knew how many colors to use. That his, he was thinking perhaps overall on his image. This is a fun one. The lady with the umbrella. I think it's just very, you know, it's very stylistic, you know, in this Erte, it's a... And his name was and, Roman Tartikoff. By Erte, or R and T were his initials. Here's a flapper. And the block, I mean, just the color blocking. It's like, you know, it's very precise. My question that I, when I look at this kind of Erte's illustrations or other types of illustrations that are fashion oriented or costume oriented, they are, they're giving us a character, right? Where the gesture drawings aren't really giving us a character, they're, they're implying, right? This one's very much saying, this is a personality, this is a character, and it's this character because of this particular silhouette or this particular color or this particular color combination or this this way this fabric moves on the body right it's a it's telling us a particular it's giving us a particular image of this woman right right and so that is my question is is she still that woman without that garment or is the image in the garment you know so can we move to this Karen Lamont floating world? Yes. This is another way of looking at the body and looking at, um, and this is a really good one to start with. And this, I was this one here. Yeah, I was introduced to her while in, at uh, SMSU. And these are sculptures. 
for my in my grad program in getting my MFA right. was when I found Karen Lamont. And she was at the she had some work at the De Young Museum. In San Francisco. In San yeah. Francisco, yeah. And she does these And so what what material is she using here? Here I think she's used she was using um, glass. I think she yeah, moved there's to glass in the back of the book. Porcelain. And she oh. is using clay, I believe, as well now. Okay. But when I first discovered her, she was working primarily in glass. Um, so here's a glass sculpture. Yeah. Yeah. And it as and these are called the empty garment, right? These are there are a series of artists that work in empty garments, and um, the, she happens to be a glass, in this case, a glass sculpture, right? Um, she's a sculpturess versus a painter, right. or um, and it, somebody, uh, uh, and then you know who's a performance artist or an installation artist. Mm -hmm. um, but this conversation about the image is the does the image exist? I mean, I know it tangibly exists, but does the image of the person exist within that? Is the personality already there without right. the body in it? So these are metal. This next section of the book are metal, which and, look, and the patina makes it look like that. And what is it about human nature wanting to transform their persona? Uh huh. Right. Why do we want to put on maybe? Some people more than others. Why do we want to perform, perform a persona, right, in a on a particular given day? So all the world's a stage. Yeah, and as women, we do it all the time because it's marketed to us right. that a certain body type, a certain image type, at a, at a certain age, the way you should look or the way you should be, should be. Right is is, and then some people rebel against that and do something completely opposite of that because there's non-conformity. There's conformity, so that's where I talk about we actually even deform ourselves, right? So we're we're right. conforming, reforming, and deforming ourselves constantly in our image uh, um, that how we want to be perceived. So can we talk about the paintings that are behind me yes. a little bit? So I love this beautiful one, the bright colors on this one. Do you have any insight that you want to share or what you might have? She turned out really interesting. She actually has a tendency, some people think she, they can see a face or looks like a bug in it. She, uh, I have pictures of my process. Um, this painting looked a lot of different ways along the road. Um, in the background, I collaged uh, pattern pieces, tissue pattern pieces here from McCall's or Simplicity in the background to give a foundation. I used paint. Um, I have this kind of dress symbol that is like, you know, the perfect body, the perfect dress, the perfect female persona that I worked with. I was just working with it over and over again on a series of paintings. And then I'd go back in and I'd sand and I'd destroy it and I'd pull it apart. I think, I think there was a whole process for me wanting to, I was my own discovery, like constructing it and deconstructing it. It was my way of finding what is it that I'm trying to say. So this one is a little more of a, yeah. a ballerina, perhaps? Yeah. I staged this on a dress farm with pink tulle in my studio, and I painted this really within one day. This one happened in one day, where this one took a series of months. Right. Yes. Because I was just doing like a quick, similar right. to the gesture. So, and then I'm intrigued by the dark one because of the way you use light 
and shadow. I had an artist friend to ask me if I could paint without color because I like color a lot. So this is black and white because they, they didn't they challenged me. They said, "Can you paint without color?" So um, I really this was a light study. This was a study of light. Can I bring the form coming out of the black? Oh, there's some glare with this. And so we'll try to fix that. So could I so, could I bring the form of the dress or the dress form out of the black, out of the darkness and bring it forward right. by just working with light? Right. So there there are um, we have just a couple of minutes left in our our time. Um, and um, there are a bunch of these outside in the gallery. The one problem in the gallery, for those of you on Facebook, is that um, <laughs> is that the acoustics are bad, and there are people who are going to be talking. So I'm not sure how much we'll be able to say, um, except that you'll get to see some of the other images um, with that. So if I don't get to say it later, if you're if you're in Palm Springs. You know, come on down. I'm going to be here till eight o'clock, um, and you can see these in person. Um, they are really great. Let's go. So look at my art. Walk out into the gallery and see what's going on. Hello. 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 We're bringing the show out here. Hi. I'm Keith. Yes. this video and uh, maybe by tomorrow or the next day um, permanently but I'm going to leave it on Facebook